we're, we're running back quite a 20 minutes late or so, so let's get started immediately. We're going to begin with Max Keane, who's going to be sp speaking about art as a means of combating alienation, which links nicely to what we heard this morning. So can we give a round of applause to Max? Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chile. Um, so yeah, I, I'm so grateful to be here, given the opportunity to talk about what art can do in times of crisis, and especially in a context where art and place are intertwined in such a compelling way. Uh, I'm happy to be talking a bit both about art and place. Um, in particular, I was interested in the question of if art can be therapeutic in times of crisis, and I certainly think it can be. Uh, I think part of that function of it being therapeutic is related to its ability to help us get a clearer understanding of our contemporary moment. Um, I think when the world has changed so rapidly in a way that feels confusing and, and deeply alienating to many of us, uh, art has this kind of unique importance because of its quality to interpret and, and make sense of the world around us. I'll start with a familiar face here, uh, something Robert Rauschenberg said in an interview in the late 90s that uh, has always kind of stuck with me. The interviewer was joking around saying, um, you know, when I look around the stage, I see old lighting equipment and you look around and you see the beginnings of art, you know, kind of, it's a very basic sort of question, but it's, it's kind of charming. And then Rauschenberg, uh, you know, is then asked, uh, so y what do you want us to see? What do you want us to see when we look around? And Rauschenberg said very plainly, uh, I want you to feel at home. And I think that that is uh, really something art can do. And I think uh, I'm very grateful for Adrian's uh, talk just previous to mine and the defining of alienation in its relationship to uh, sense of place and feeling at home. Uh, so part of the reason I feel so strongly that art can be therapeutic in times of crisis is because of my own experience making art during the onset of COVID. Um, I was in Montreal during COVID and uh, I felt very new to the city when the pandemic hit. Uh, Montreal was hit very hard by COVID, kind of uniquely so in Canada. Um, there were cases oftentimes higher than any other Canadian city. There was a curfew that lasted 140 days. And oftentimes when I tell people about the curfew uh, outside of Montreal, they don't always know the details. And so to sort of clarify that, it was uh, 8.30 p.m. for the vast majority of the time. Um, it was enforced quite strictly. You could walk around the block with your dog, but nothing else was permitted. And you were fined pretty extensively if you were um, caught outside for a stretch of time. And in the beginning, a, a lot of homeless people were fined. So it was a very intense curfew. And the only experiences that, uh, you know, so many of the things actually that make Montreal rich are these social experiences, the things that um, really disappeared during COVID. And so that was very difficult. Uh, the experiences that I started you know, really defining my time there were just walking around outside. That was kind of the only thing you could do. And so that's what I did a lot of. I walked around and explored the city and I became really interested in, in doing that and, uh, and taking photos of things that I saw that caught my eye and I thought were strange. Uh, looking at things like sun faded imagery in the front of a shop window, you know, peering in an old building, looking down uh, back alleyways and behind construction sites. Um, these are things that I've kind of always liked to do and I, I, I grew up in the prairies and felt like when I was younger that a lot of the conventional ways um, of enjoying the city as a young person uh, didn't really suit me and I had to do things the wrong way to make them interesting. I had to kind of experience the city the wrong way and in some ways I think of that as kind of the beginning of thinking artistically for me. I think a lot of what we do as artists is trying to find the wrong way to do something or use a tool. Um, so going back to this process of walking around and taking photos, I mean, it was, it was something that uh, just felt all the more important. And I think especially in contrast to how digital spaces began to feel for me during the pandemic, the internet being the space where work and social life had all coalesced, I began to really dislike digital spaces and uh, value more so these kind of novel experiences I had walking around. Um, in, you know, in the internet, uh, in the digital spaces on the internet, everything was very transparent. Everything felt very close. You always knew what everyone was doing at any time. Um, and everyone was always available. 
and I really began more so to value the kind of texture and strangeness of the world around me. You know, what's going on in that building, down that side street? Uh, I really had worked digitally for a long time, but had begun kind of through this period of uh, COVID to value more so the spontaneity and the wildness that I was associating with these walks around town. Um, so now to get into some work. Uh, so in terms of the first pieces that I made, it was the dead of winter uh, in the curfew in Montreal, I started working the way that I do now. And I wanted to make work that was rooted in these everyday perceptions. Um, and I also wanted to make the work physical. Again, I was more familiar with working digitally previously. Uh, I've used Photoshop since I was very young. Um, it's, you know, photography, things like that, were, have always been a core of my practice. And I wanted to explore the, essentially the tools that are kind of the physical predecessor to things like Photoshop and image manipulation, uh, specifically using photographic emulsion and uh, the airbrush. And so these two pieces from January 2021 are uh, the first two that I made using the materials that I use for my work now and uh, have continued to work with these materials since. And so to talk a little bit about how everything looks and um, for those that like the sort of behind the scene, how the sausage is made, uh, here we are. I hope it's interesting. Um, so the work does begin, like I mentioned, kind of with these everyday perceptions, uh, photos that I take and, and gather, they serve as the basis for these pieces. And then what happens is I produce photographic negatives uh, using digital transparencies that are digitally printed. You can see the beginning of this process here, uh, printer transparencies laid flat on emulsion coated paper with panes of glass. Um, you'll see later in the process that these panes of glass are kind of produced as process marks in the work, uh, and I'm interested in that. I like the kind of scrapes and bruises that an image accumulates when it goes through this transition. And it also allows me to create photogram elements in the piece, and in this case, these glasses you see in kind of the lower section of the image are you know, reproduced as a, a photogram. Uh, then going from there, it's a pretty extensive amount of airbrush painting. You see on the left there an image just exposed without any alteration, and then on the right, uh, the beginnings of painting with a, an extensive amount of masking being really crucial to the process. Uh, again, a lot of these things are these, these ways of working are the predecessor to things like Photoshop you know, the soft brush mark, the masking, uh, things like that. And so I love the areas where there's this kind of confusion and blending between painting and photographic material. Um, I think it promotes the kind of investigation that I love so much about the spaces that I'm interested in and, uh, and the imagery that I'm interested in. Uh, the desire to figure things out uh, in some, you know, a degree of mystery, I suppose. And then the finished piece here um, and of course, framed. So this is, yeah, and made with an oak frame that kind of echoes the, the palette and, and forms of the piece. Obviously, oak being kind of an indicative of this office um, furniture and, and that being featured prominently centrally in the composition. Uh, but yeah, going forward uh, into some more work, uh, I'm really interested in producing work that has a material connection to the image making tools that are ubiquitous today. Uh, while most of what we see isn't necessarily photographic exposures, it's um, you know, a time when photography is more ubiquitous than ever. Things like cell phone cameras and social media being the reason for this. And similarly, a tool like an airbrush isn't used in everyday life, but what an airbrush uh, has as its function is essentially manipulating photographs. It's, you know, the idea of an airbrushed photograph is very literally synonymous with a manipulated photograph or a filtered photograph. And these works in material are literally airbrushed photographs. Um, so, you know, these tools of photographic exposure and airbrush are, again, kind of this, this lineage for the image production of today. Uh, but rather, of course, than going to, you know, work with things that reproduce the kinds of images that proliferate in digital spaces, I'm more interested in using the tools to evoke a wildness and irregularity of physical space. And oftentimes the work draws from uh, very specific physical spaces that I have a recollection of. Um, you know, the door in particular being from a house that I lived in for a period of time, and also thinking about a casino space that I remembered uh, from my hometown that was in a converted train station, and the sort of dissonance between its out-of-place character uh, being something that I wanted to evoke. And then 
you know, going from there, in addition to physical spaces, uh, the physicality of material is also something that is very important to me. In this case, the fabric backdrop for this image is produced by a physical manipulation of the, the fabric of, the, you know, the substrate of the work itself, scrunching it and manipulating it like a backdrop and then painting it from different angles with an airbrush and then ironing it flat, giving it this, this record of its actual physical history that then becomes integrated into the piece itself. Uh, some more details closer up of the piece. Um, in many of the images, uh, a lot of what kind of brought this one about was my own experience. Uh, briefly, one of the many odd jobs I worked uh, as a practicing artist is being a uh, school picture day photographer. And I was, uh, that was a very funny job and experience, but uh, more than anything, I was so fascinated by the strangeness of what was just outside of the frame. You know, when you set up a camera and, uh, you know, this kind of, and a backdrop, the edges and the fringes that are cropped out are, are kind of the most interesting part. And in a lot of ways, that's what my work is interested in, this kind of uh, back of house, behind the scenes, these spaces that are sites of production to some degree. Um, and I'm also very interested in having the work uh, deal with decisions that are made for me by the space and, and having to work with them. For instance, with this piece here, uh, this is really derived from this coffee shop in Richmond, VC. I wonder if people have been here. It's called Viva Java. Um, it exists on the edge of this industrial area. Uh, and if you ever miss the ferry and have some time to kill coming back to the island, uh, certainly a place you can go to. And very strange decor. Uh, a lot of decisions that are quite bizarre, like an indoor clay roof and peapock feathers in a vase and a neon signage. And I wanted to sort of capture these strange out of step elements. And then of course the the cup being painted with acrylic to uh, resemble. It's obviously this trompe l'oeil sort of uh, uh, element that actually resembles the coffee cups there. But to conclude and wrap things up, I, I think for many of us to kind of bring it back around, this, uh, this sense of, this ambient sense of alienation with place, you know, feeling things like that the cities we live in aren't, uh, you know, always built to serve us best or that our economic system isn't built to serve us best, uh, and the degree to which I think COVID has accelerated so many of the crises of capitalism uh, brings all these feelings kind of to the forefront, at least for a lot of people I know. And I would hope that the function of my work can be to promote this kind of consideration of space, spaces around you, and I think the benefit of that being that um, if you have a more curious and explorational relationship with your surroundings, you can better understand your own sense of place and then perhaps have an easier time making changes in the world around you or at least uh, feel a little bit more at home. Um, so thank you.